Welcome to Education Talks, I'm David Burke. Kate O'Connell, an educational leader, coach and speaker, has over 25 years of experience in education. She's worked and consulted in 30 schools in 12 countries on four continents. When she visited Bangkok recently, it was a real pleasure to meet up with her in person and have her as a guest on Education Talks. So Kate, welcome to Education Talks. Thank you, thank you for having me. Now, of course, uh, you didn't fly all the way here to Bangkok just uh, to see me, but I appreciate you being here on the show. Um, great location we're in here at the moment as well. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful um, garden. It is, it's fantastic. Uh, but where are you based at the moment? Currently, I'm based in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. I work at the Australian International School of Phnom Penh. I've also worked at the, Inter the Giving Tree International School and Northbridge International School of Cambodia. So I know the educational landscape of Cambodia quite well. Fantastic. Uh, what is it like to live uh, in Phnom Penh? Is it an is it a enjoyable place to be? I love the funkiness of it all. Yeah. You know, like when um, you might see like a tuk-tuk full of chickens <laughs> <laughs> or a um, truckload of melons you know, and the ice man comes and there's big buckets of ice and he cuts it off. So you're living like otherworldly, yep. yet it's incredibly easy. It's easy to mm. order food. It's easy to get stuff. It's easy to do your banking on an app. Wow. So there's this uh, juxtaposition of really quite different uh, developing country mm. and an ease. Yep. yep. I've only been there. I think uh, for just a few days being to Phnom Penh, and so that's a place I'd like to go back and explore, particularly, of course, uh, more of the country yeah. outside of the capital. So can you tell us a little bit about your, your role in the school that you're working in? I've changed roles a few times, but currently I'm in the half-day two-year-olds class. Oh, wow. And um, I had a different role in leadership previously, and... I found that a hidden passion for working with two-year-olds that I never knew I had. I would never have just said, sign me up for two-year-olds. But it's amazing. One of, um, in my background, I've taught a lot of first grade, but I've also taught second grade and third grade and seventh grade science. And um, in first grade, kids come and a lot of times they don't know how to read or write. And at the end of the year, you're like, oh my gosh, you know, like they're reading, they're writing, like they've changed so much. And you just don't get that in like a second grade or a third grade classroom. You just don't get that amount of growth. Yes. And I feel like that's just like the two-year-olds. They come and they cry. They cry for the first six weeks, like 10 kids all crying at once. And then they get s sorted. And then after they get settled, it's like you're designing these learning environments and they start to engage with the materials and then they start to engage with you. And like when a little two-year-old grabs your hand and says, come, let's play over here. And like, you know, you're like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then they realize they can play with each other. And then they realize they can communicate mm -hmm. and, um, you know, tell you that they want to sing uh, the good morning song to their dad at home. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really cool to see how kids develop and I have a background in early years and it's a lot of times when I'm doing workshop leading for the mm -hmm. IB I do early years workshops mm -hmm. and I've never been able to speak to the um, people in the room with authority with experience about but what do we do about the two-year-olds that are not yet in um, really in the IB because it starts at three so I'm really grateful for this experience of doing two-year-olds that I did not expect. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about um, doing work for the IB. What uh, sort of interested you in, in pursuing sort of speaking and, and workshops? Is that something that uh, you really enjoy? Funny story. Um, so I started my teaching career in Michigan in the United States. And uh, at the time, Michigan did a lot of professional development for teachers. And at the time, <laughs> so funny now phonics was a bad word but I got sent to a phonics workshop and it was at a hotel and this lady was presenting I think it was like modern curriculum press phonics right and I was like I want to do what she's doing mm -hmm. I know like I'm going to be doing that I'm going to be talking not about phonics but 
I, I want to influence teachers. Like, so, you know, it really determined a lot of my career because I've had, you know, I've taught two-year-olds, uh, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, uh, all the way up to seventh grade science. Um, I now teach adults through IB, through Compass, through trust-based observations. Um, and I thought, I, in order to become a workshop leader, somebody that speaks about education, um, you have to have a lot of different kind of experiences, right? So that you can speak with it with authority. She spoke with such good authority. She was so knowledgeable. And I thought, I, I just, I, I, I knew, you know, that when you mm -hmm. just see something and you're like, yep, that's me. Mm -hmm. I want that. So, uh, Kate, what led you to working in international schools? So, another story. I was a student at Michigan State University, and it was after a yoga, I had a yoga or gym class, and I was walking by the union, and I was in the, in the teaching program, um, and I wandered into this event room where they were having an overseas career fair for international educators. And I was like, oh wait, what's this? And then it was the same way they do a lot of the fairs today. They had the, the sheet of paper up on a stand or behind them and a table. And then it was like, you know, um, an international school in Guyana or, um, you know, a place in Africa that I had absolutely never heard of. And I was like, wow wow, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Like, I want to go abroad and teach and see the world. Because, you know, as a teacher, we don't, you know, you don't teach for the money. Yeah. Um, and I always wanted to travel. So I thought, oh, that's perfect. You travel, you teach, and you travel. <laughs> yes, I think for everybody, there's sort of like this sudden realization about international schools at some point in their career, where it's like, wow, this, this is too good to be true. And I think for people who enjoy traveling, it's just like, it's a eureka moment, isn't it? When yes. When you're a teacher and you love to travel and you discover international schools, it's like, wow, this is perfect. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, where else have you worked? You've worked in a number of countries. Where have Correct. you worked and lived? Uh, what's been enjoyable about each place? So um, I started my career in the U.S. I taught first grade and third grade in Michigan. And then uh, signed up with Cersei Associates mm -hmm. a very long time ago. Yep. And uh, I decided that if I could teach in the inner city of Chicago, I could go anywhere. So I did a year in the mm -hmm. inner city of Chicago, seventh grade science, loved it. Felt like I was really making a difference. Um, but I wanted to travel. I got an opportunity to go to China. I taught in Tianjin. Wow. I loved it. It was, there were no personal cars on the road. Mm -hmm. There were Thai, old, women and men doing Tai Chi in the park. Um, there weren't a lot of foreign goods at the time. It was really the old China. Mm. Um, so that was amazing. I loved it. I learned to speak Chinese wow. from basically from taxi drivers. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people would laugh at my Chinese accent and they would say, oh, you sound like a, a taxi <laughs> <Something> driver. <laughs> um, from uh, China, I did through Michigan State, they had a program specifically for international teachers, international school teachers, to get their master's. Okay. So I got my master's um, in curriculum and instruction. And in that program, I met someone who from the International School of Tanganyika in Dar es Salaam. And I was like, I keep seeing these teachers everywhere that have come from this IST school. And they're all, they've got stars in their eyes and Africa and safaris and... I want to go there. So I thought if I ever got a chance, I would. And so um, so I got to go to Africa and Tanzania. And um, that was professionally brilliant because I got my first IB. It's a top tier IB school. Um, and I, they always were quite humble. And they, it was a good school that could always do better at, um, at that time. And I worked with really great leaders. Um, so I really, I and the, the colleagues that I had there were just insanely amazing. Um, but my personal life was quite hard. I got sick, my mother got sick, and I left to go take care of my mom uh, when she was, a, a, you know, her last days of life. And then I taught again in Chicago, but this time 
So this is kind of going back to the, the idea that I want to be a workshop leader and have different experiences, right? So I always thought it would be really good to get rural experience, that's what I had in Michigan, inner city experience, that's what I had in Chicago, mm -hmm. international experience, mm -hmm. but I didn't have that experience of an affluent school. Mm -hmm. So um, I went for a job in a suburb of Chicago called Wilmette, and I taught there for five years. Um, and that was very interesting because I had been in the inquiry-based IB world, and then I went into um, a suburban school where their, their school data, you know, like say for the math scores was like at a 97 um, percent and they wanted to raise it to 99. Oh. So that's like di a different type of work yes. that you're doing. Um, how do you make something that's really good and you have evidence of, you know, almost greatness yes. and how do you push yourself and how do you stretch mm. your school, your teachers, your district? Um, but I kept a part of that inquiry in me, and I'm like, I want to, I want to go back into the world of IB. Um, and I had an opportunity uh, with my family to go to Thailand. Mm -hmm. um, it was a really hard choice because we had other places in the world, and I'm like, Thailand is like the best place on the planet. That's like the end of your career. You know, it might ruin us <laughs> going anywhere else because yeah. like Thailand. Yeah, hard act to follow, right? So we ended up at Prem. Um, my kids went there. At Prem is an amazing school. Prem is Prem Tinsalanandia International School, and some sometimes it's referred to as Prem Center um, in the past, or PTIS. And um, they have a cooking school and a cricket academy, or at least they did when I was there, and a farm. Um, and that's where I really developed... Um, an understanding of how to put systems thinking and tools behind my passion for sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I trained to be a Compass Education workshop leader, or help right. start the movement of Compass Education. Um, and from there, uh, Phnom Penh. Wow. Any um, particular, well, it's probably an unfair question to ask, but uh, favorite place to live so far? I would have to say, hands down, Chiang Mai. Wow. Chiang Mai was brilliant. We lived in the forest, uh, you know, and that's where my, my son was born. And uh, the people, my nanny, like yeah. the Thai language, I, I love it all. The weather, the beauty of the mountains, the flora, the fauna, it's just, yeah, I love it. It's a very special place, isn't it? What about that one time of the year when the, the air quality is not so good? I mean you get used to that? Is that something that just sort of marks the season or is it, uh, or is it a, is it a bit of a struggle? It is a struggle. I was very fortunate because my son was born in March and I was really worried about him being born into this very smoky world. And that year, the, the air quality was really, really good. Um, having gone back to Chiang Mai um, in recent times, the, the, it's worse. Yeah. Um, but having, you know, my experience of living in China in Tianjin right. in the 1999 to 2002, there was like physical dumping of chemicals and like on like a Thursday and Friday, you could taste the pollution. Wow. You could feel it in your eyes. So um, a temporary burning mm. situation Not so bad. felt very different yes. than chemical pollution, pollution that hovers in the sky yeah. that you fly through. You know, it's, it's different. It is not easy to deal with. But um, but it's different. It's sort of worth the uh, sacrifice to enjoy the rest of the year there. I love that. Place. Yeah. So, Kate, uh, what are you most passionate about in education, and how are you going about pursuing it? So, I am most passionate about um, something I am calling humane education. Um, I believe that having a systems thinking background, I believe that there are systems and structures, or if you come from a design thinking background, there's design flaws in education that create a system that is not functioning to its highest potential. And I think there are small changes we can make in the design or in the system uh, to make it better for all. So, uh, you know, I see 
teachers being cruel to other teachers, teachers being cruel to admin, admin being cruel to teachers. And there's an opportunity there for us to reflect, especially now after COVID. There is so much fatigue and I think there is a collective trauma um, with teaching. So I'd like to, you know, I'm IB through and through and it's the, we'll make a, a better world through education. You know, I really do, I do want to make a better, more peaceful world through education, but we have to look at education and see before we start fixing the world, like let's fix education. Yes. I often wonder how much of school we do is simply because we've always done it that way. Yeah. That is an article. Mm. Saber, have you read the saber tooth tiger article? Yeah. Well, it was part of my master's. You know, like it was like teaching the saber tooth tiger curriculum yeah. even after they went extinct. <laughs> so, Kate, uh, you have uh, big dreams and a lot of passion in education. Where do you see yourself in the next five years? Well, I hope to be traveling around the world and changing educational systems. Um, so I hope in five years time, I will know a bit more about the systems and structures that create a, a humane system. I have found some to be, um, I fully believe in the IB, um, I, or you could say inquiry based education, concept based education, um, that is collaborative. Also, um, education for sustainability is sustainable habits of mind. Um, I believe uh, compass education is one of those humane practices that uh, looks at, you know, um, nature, economy, society, and well-being. Um, Trust-based observations, um, changing the way that teachers are viewed and valued and um, observed. Yes. Uh, and recently talking uh, with EduSpark mm -hmm. about um, really changing the way we do a one and done professional development. So uh, I want to turn my passion into my paid work and help to move forward initiatives that will make these changes that I believe in. So I hope to be consulting coaching, speaking, um, and I love to podcast. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah, well, um, plenty plenty of podcasts to be on, and I'm really grateful you could uh, come on this show. Um, so, Kate, you're quite active on social media. How can people reach out and connect with you? Yeah, so my website is my full name, Catherine, and then my middle initial, M, and I tell you that, I'll tell you why in a minute, Catherine M. O'Connell. Uh, dot com. M is Michelle, but many people will see the website and think I'm Catherine Moconnell. <laughs> I'm not Catherine Moconnell, but it does make me laugh. Um, on Twitter, I'm at Innovate Creator, spelled incorrectly with an E for the creator, because when I signed up for Twitter way, way back, right, uh, it took my blog name, and I used to have a blog called Innovate, Create, and Relate with Kate. Because I like, I believe in building relationships yes. and and you know harnessing our collective um, intelligence mm -hmm. to move things forward. So I've always wanted to kind of change things. So that's Twitter, mm -hmm. and then on Facebook, I have a Facebook page. I think it's called Catherine M O'Connell Edu, mm -hmm. um, and on LinkedIn, I'm Kate O'Connell. Mm -hmm. So. And we'll make sure to put all the links, of course, in the description. Just look for them right now. And, uh, look, Kate, it's been fantastic having you uh, on the program. Thanks so much. And looking forward to keeping in touch and uh, seeing what the future has in store. Absolutely. Good luck with your podcast. Thank you. Happy to be on it. Thanks very much. And uh, we, of course, filmed uh, this episode here at Hunter's Garden Restaurant, also in the description. It's a great place to come and enjoy a nice meal and this uh, fantastic little setting out the back. If you enjoyed this episode of Education Talks, please do share with your friends and colleagues. Don't forget to stay subscribed to catch each new episode.